We finished uh, last hour with an explosive argument by Maria. Your last name is Karpinen, isn't it? You are not in any way related to this Finnish uh, Perti Karpinen. No, unfortunately. Have you heard about Perti Karpinen? He is a very famous Finnish rower. He took three Olympic gold medals in a row, I think. So you're not related to him. No, so Karpinen is a common name in Finland. <laughs> Men, no. it's not common. No. Then you are related to him. You should. Uh, you must always utilize uh, what you can in this world. But I according to Maria, she is more than happy if she gets another left <laughs> shoe. <laughs> and of course, that's legal. But uh, in our theory, we don't uh, we don't assume that possible. Because if you get another left shoe, you can throw it away. <laughs> and uh, then uh, it shouldn't matter. So that's kind of the argument here, okay? But it doesn't mean that not you could be like that, and other people could be like that as well. Yeah, okay. So uh, I think uh, we just have to settle with that here. Okay, enough about perfect substitute and perfect complements, meaning that anything in between is neither perfect substitute nor perfect complements then when it comes to the utility behavior of the consumer. Okay, here we introduce formally this concept of a utility function and indifference curves. The utility function defines individual consumer preferences mathematically, or as I said previously by, what do you call that? Oh, by transforming preferences into numbers. So you could say, in a sense, that uh, there is a logic here. If, if some good bundle A is preferred to some good bundle B, then the utility of receiving this A should be larger than the utility of receiving this B. This is kind of the mechanism we're introducing now. So we assume now that we are kind of able to find these mathematical functions here, which we refer to as utility functions which can preserve these in all kind of possible situations. And it turns out that we can that without going into too much detail here. So here is an example of a utility function. Given that there are two bundles we want to kind of choose between, of course it needs to have two arguments. So this is not a single variable function, it's a two variable function. And if we try to draw this function, it uh, may look like some kind of space in three dimensions, maybe with some kind of top point. If we are greedy, then we would expect that if we do kind of kind of change in our battle that makes us more happy, then we would like to keep on doing that till we can't do it anymore. Then we then we reach some kind of maximal point, haven't we? So if I take more food and then a little less clothes and I keep on doing this all the way, improving my utility, making it larger, then I'm more happy by definition. And then uh, hopefully or, or reasonably there is a certain point where I can't get more unhappy. If I move from that point, I get, I get more unhappy. And this is this kind of top point here. Uh, in order to move from an indifference, no, sorry, from a utility function to an indifference curve, it's a straightforward mathematical technique we apply. And it's tried uh, explained here. The transformation to indifference curves uh, is done in a two-step process, it says here. Define a, so a utility function, as we have done here, in this case f times c, and equate that utility function to any number, for instance 25, as in this example, and then solve with respect to one of the variables. So in this case that's easy, isn't it? If uh, we follow this procedure then f times c equates to 25. What this means of course is that if we start changing f now we have also have to typically change c to preserve this number and we then we move from one to another point on the indifference curve because the utility is the same. And as long as we accept that utility measures our satisfaction level, when we keep to a fixed utility level, then we are always on an indifference curve. So by equating our utility function to a constant, then we can derive an indifference curve. And that's straightforward here. 
in this case we can solve it let's say for instance with respect to f we can just divide on each side of the equation sign with uh, sorry with c in that case we get rid of it here and we end up with this expression which then is a functional description of an indifference curve and of course we can draw this indifference curve now based on this uh, functional expression if we construct a diagram where we have c on the first axis and f the output on the second axis then we can start making a table can't we so if we start with c equal to uh, one uh, you see we can't start with c equal to zero can we what happens if you take 25 <coughs> divided by zero what kind of a result would that give hmm? would it get would we get zero do you have a calculator here if you try to we can't do that can we if we take 25 divided by 0 0.0 then we get a very large number so this turns out to move towards infinity it becomes infinitely large any number divided by 0 is infinity okay so we can't uh, for our uh, drawing purposes use 0 here so we have to start with 1 and then of course we can compute the f which corresponds to it if we set c equal to 1 25 divided by 1 we get 25 okay if you set c equal to 2 25 divided by 2 is 12 and a half isn't it mm -hmm. 3 25 divided by 3 that's a bit more tricky so we just jump into 5 here to make it easier 25 over 5 is 5 and then let's take 10 then we get 2.5 don't we mm -hmm. now we have some numbers we can draw them here <coughs> one two three four five six seven eight nine ten will appear uh, 25 is here the half a between is 12.5 that should be sufficient for one we get 25 that's up here for two you get 12.5 that's there for five we get five five is bah 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 bah. this is seven and a half so it's down here is five one two three four five it should go, go get down there you see and ten it's two point five then we are half in between here so we get down here so we get some kind of curve here which uh, looks like it should <coughs> in a way okay it behaves in the direct it kind of included in these extremes here and there so you see that's how we can find an indifference curve if that is interesting and of course the reason why we do this is, is that to some extent it is interesting to find an in indifference curve so actually we may like to draw several indifference curves in the same diagram as we did on the right here an indifference map now we, an we, we can of course do the same in excel can't we so let's do that once more it's, it's it doesn't take much time so let's take this down go into Excel again and we do as we did before but we don't start with zero now let's start with a different number one for this C column and no, we can't put all numbers here can't we so we should say equal A1 which is the column uh, the cell on top plus one and then we add one more so it should be two and then uh, see now what I do I have to move this one down here to get the black cross then I can copy I get some numbers here and then of course I have to enter the expression which is this okay so it should be 25 divided by then you use this sign and it should be divided by a1 shouldn't it mm -hmm. yeah then we get 25 as we should corresponds here we repeat the process by copying this one again the black square and then we get some numbers here and then we do what we did previously we mark both columns why did I get this black arrow here like this and then I insert that again into a scatter plot like this and then you see we get a nice indifference curve I can draw several indi indifference curve similarly instead of having 25 on top 
you see that 25 is lying on top of the fraction. So if I want a bigger utility, I can put 35, for instance, or whatever. So if I just if I just take this one and copy it over here, then I get something else here because I don't want B1 there. You see, this is a. I still want to divide by A1 here, but I change the 25 to let's say 50 to get some change, and then uh, I can draw. Then of course I have to copy this one as well down here, and let's draw both in the same diagram again. Insert, scatter. So you see, we can just build as many as we like very easy in Excel here to kind of get these so-called indifference maps, if that is interesting. Do you want to have this one as well? OK, then we save it. On our desktop, we call it um, indifference map. Save it and then we there it is. Does it seem correct? Yes. Then we upload it to Frontier to the added material part. There it is. Open. Okay, there it is. So you can look at it if you like. So, no, what happened? Ah, there it is. Okay. So this was... Anything you're wondering about down there? Our Icelandic friends, do we, do, do we need to explain something more? Arnur, Farnar, and Farnar. Do we need? Do I need to explain something? No, you could just tell me, okay? Yeah. Okay. So this is how we construct indifference curves. So here you see a figure in the textbook where we have used this example, and we have first uh, put it to 25, and then 50, as we did in the Excel case, and also up to 100, and you see, we get these shapes. And here we keep this food and clothes as the two bundles we choose in between. It says here that a utility function can be represented by a set of indifference curves, each with a numerical indicator. So we need to kind of define the constant level of utility that we want to draw the indifference curve for, of course. The figure shows three different indif three indifference curves with utility levels of 25, 50, and 100, respectively associated with the given utility function f times c. As you remember when we talked about mathematics, sometimes you, you write f times c, sometimes you just write fc, and of course it means the same in both cases. Something you may not be aware of, uh, and which is a neat trick to be aware of, is that uh, to avoid mixing actual text and mathematics, we, need, we, we normally use italics when we write math. So in order of not interpreting this as football club, it's written in, in, in italics here, meaning that this is a mathematical expression. It should hence mean f times c and represent the example we look at. This is something you perhaps should be aware of. So most serious textbooks or papers or <coughs> articles would actually do this. And it's, it's uh, actually essential in some, some cases. Okay, so the next step. Remember, we should kind of start with consumer preferences. Okay, now we have finished consumer preferences. We, we, have, we have kind of argued that preferences may be different, but the output of this argument is that we should be able to describe a consumer by his or her utility function. So each consumer has utility function linked <coughs> to him or her. Okay, that's the idea here. Then we shall start talking about budget constraints. Okay, you know, as we probably are aware of, we cannot normally get what we want. 
without paying for it. So there is certain prices here which reflects uh, the value normally of various objects, of course depending on the market evaluation, but we have to handle these prices. And um, this concept of a budget line is kind of the simplest way we can try to model uh, some kind of pricing mechanism. So what we assume here is the following. We assume that there is a certain price of food here in the equation on top referred to as PF. So F means food, so P means price, so PF is price of food. And this capital F here is the amount of food we buy, which refers to the variable F, which we kind of have used already. Okay, And then PC is the price of clothes, and C is the amount of clothes we buy. And a budget line then tells us that given that we have a certain income available, which is referred to as capital I here, then of course, we, unless we can borrow money or steal, then uh, we have to kind of be within this big I. So if we buy more food, then we have, have to buy less clothes, given that we spend all we have in the first instance. So this budget line kind of constrains how we can behave in this situation. Uh, we can look at a, a strict example here on the left. If the price of food is 1 uh, and the price of clothes is 2 and uh, our income is 80, then of course we can substitute this PF and PC and I with these numbers. <coughs> so PF times P is then 1 times F, sorry PF times F is 1 times F and we can take out the 1 because it doesn't change anything and then PC is 2 times C then we get 2C down here don't we? And it should equal 80. If we like to draw a budget line, we can do that now, can't we? Because this is a straight line in a plane. We can solve it with respect to F, as we do here. Put F on the left-hand side, move 2C to the right-hand side. Of course, we have to change the si sign, and then we get F equal to 80 minus 2C, which is a straightforward linear function that could be plotted, for instance, like this. You see that if C equals 0, then this one vanishes. F should be 80. That produces this point. If you put 80 minus 2c equal to 0, then you take 2c over, divide by 2, and get c equal to 80 divided by 2, which is 40. So that, that gives us the other crossing point. So that is the explanation for this line, which is a different representation of the mathematical form. But of course, it means the same, if you like. In some cases, in microeconomics, we would refer to a, we would keep this parametric structure. Of course, then it gets a little bit more intricate because you need to kind of keep track of more symbols. But the structure is, of course, exactly similar. Um, <coughs> then you keep PF and PC, and of course, you can still solve it with respect to F, can't you? You take this term, move it to the right-hand side, as we do here. Then you have to divide by PF to get F as a variable alone on the left-hand side. So you, you have to divide I by PF producing this fraction, and PC times C divided by PF to produce that fraction. In most cases, we write it like this, keeping the constants on top of each other, so isolating the variable as well. And we are aware of this now. F and C are things that vary in our equation. This PF, PC, and I are assumed given. So they are representing num numbers which kind of defines the situation. But they can still vary as we say. So we, in mathematics, we tend to talk about variables and parameters. So a parameter is something which is constant, but which doesn't vary in the mathematical setting we look at it. This doesn't mean that it couldn't be a variable in another setting. Okay? So this is sometimes confusing. But it's sensible, I think, to kind of keep this difference. A variable is something which varies when we look at it. A parameter is given but it can vary typically at a later stage in our an analysis. Okay. Uh, now we have already exemplified how to draw this kind of figures given numbers. So the question is, how can we draw this parametric line? We can still do that, can't we? As long as we know how to do it. Now the line looks like this. F equals I over PF 
minus PC over PF divided by Q. You can, can observe that this is the ratio of prices, isn't it? Maybe means something. Oh, if I want to draw this budget line parametrically, as in this case, then I do the use the same trick. First one is to put C equal to zero. C is the variable. Okay. Then this term vanishes, and then the result of that is that F equals I over P F, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, that produces one point in our plane. We really don't know where it is, do we? But we know something. I is an income, it must be a positive number. What do you think about this P? Should it be positive? Uh, if it's negative, then somebody will pay us for the goods to take it. That's, of course, possible. Or isn't it possible? Have you ever been in a situation that somebody both gives you a product and money at the same time? <laughs> you haven't? Oh, in Norway, you know, we have this cell phone offers where you can get a cell phone for one crown. Have you, you probably have seen this in other countries, but of course there's some added payment to the, to the, to running the, what do you call it, abundant, now this part where you actually use the phone. In Norway, I think it's illegal to have negative prices. But given that these companies had been able to give, to give negative, offer, negative offers, I'm sure they would. Because effectively they offer this cell phone for zero. And to, I'm sure that in a competitive situation, they would actually prefer to, maybe you can, they could pay me 100 crowns, I would take the phone, and then I would have to link up to their, to their uh, services. So there's really nothing wrong with the negative price, but in most cases we don't, we don't assume that it is. So if in this case then we assume that it's positive, of course this number here should be positive at least. So you know it, the F, which is here, should be up here somewhere, okay? So this distance here now is this fraction here. From zero up to this point is this fraction we, we get for the first point when C equals zero. The second is to put the whole expression to zero, I over P F minus P C over P F times C equals zero and solve for, uh, for uh, C in that case. <coughs> That brings us the crossing with the C line. Okay, we move that one to the right. We keep I over PF on the left. We change the sign here. It's PC over PF times C. E uh, sorry, those are two not so equal. As we move that one to the right hand side, then of course we have to multiply with the inverse fraction here to isolate C. Agree? So if we multiply on each side with PF over PL here, then you are able to get rid of this one and we have to multiply it with that one to get the final result. So C then should be PF over PL, which is the one we multiply with, with the one we have, times I over PF. And you see that we are able to reduce this PF here and end up with I over PL, okay? This is the distance from zero up to C, I over PL, and then we can draw our budget constraint uh, a little bit up. Yeah. Ah, you don't see due to this one. I will turn it back. <laughs> now you can write down, okay? What is the L? Oh, sorry. It should be PC. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> C, 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 C. There was nothing called L, was it? It was only clothes. I misinterpreted this for an L. And then it kind of came on. Very nice, Mario. Thanks a lot. Everything should be C, no L's here. PC means personal computer, doesn't it? <laughs> no, not in this case. Price of clothes in this case. You see, some students find this uh, tricky, okay? But it's just a matter of exercise, in my opinion. You just have to exercise this a little bit. It's much easier to learn this than playing a guitar. Infinitely much easier, in my opinion. Not to speak about the violin. 
Does anybody play violin here? Uh, if you did, you wouldn't dare to tell me, would you? <laughs> because then I would ask, ah, bring it. Uh, let's hear. <laughs> okay, I'm sure, sure some of you play guitar. There's always somebody playing guitar, isn't it? Okay. So when you see this red blackboard, it's a reminder to me to do something on the blackboard. Okay. Now hopefully, uh, as you if some of you looked at the videos from last time, you probably thought it was very hard to see anything on the blackboard. But uh, I think we have uh, been able to fix this now by this lightning. So now it should be visible uh, what I write on the blackboard. So luckily, I didn't write many interesting things last time. Okay. <coughs> Where are we now? Okay. I am happy for today. Are you happy? Is this enough? So it's no, now what we'll do next now is to move into trying to argue what happens if we change the prices. Okay. Because if we change the prices, here something happens with this line, doesn't it? And if we change the income, something also happens with the line. We can see these... Uh, straightforward here. If you increase <coughs> the income here, <coughs> keeping the PF constant, the top of the fraction increases and the whole number increases. That means that these points moves in that direction. Okay? But of course we do the same here if we, if we change increase i. So these points are also moving in that direction with the same magnitude. So by increasing this i here, we make a parallel line on top. If we decrease i, we get a parallel line under here. However, if we start changing the prices, then we start rotating it. But we will return to that next week, I think. So this is enough for today. So now we have time for some questions. If you have something <coughs> you want me to <coughs> say more about, uh, do differently, do slower, do faster, um, whatever. If you don't, then it's weekend. So you probably know in Norway, Norway, most people drink alcohol in the weekend. I do not recommend you to do that. Be careful with that. It's both expensive and dangerous. Okay, have a nice weekend.